Welcome to the best ever Brass Makers podcast. Hi, I'm Jake, and I'm joined today by my colleague Matthias here in the workshop. We're broadcasting you from Berlin, Germany. It is the 6th of November, 2020. Welcome. Hi, everyone. It's me, Matthias. So for those of you who heard us last week, thanks so much. I hope you're giving this one also a listen. Um, for those who haven't before, we're going to do a sort of a f stick to our format. We're going to basically take two questions from two different customers. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about a new product. And then we're going to talk about the history of a very famous German, Deutsch Posaun, German trombone maker, Schopper. So let's jump right into it. So question coming from a trumpet player here in Berlin. Why should I oil my valves? Well, that's a lot to unpack right there. So basically this person says, look, I only oil my valves when they stick. You know, you hear from a lot of people say, hey, you should oil, oil your valves every time before you play. Some say you should oil it also after you play in addition. Um, there's all sorts of this or that or, or different stories and wives tales out there. So what should I do? Why should I oil my valves? And I don't know, do you wanna jump in here first or do you want yeah, me to? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Uh, I've got some thoughts on that. I mean, if you don't oil your valves and they get sticky, you can't blame it on the oil because there has been no oil. To end, get to the heart of the question, um, should I oil my valves? Uh, first of all, for those who are listening, you probably are aware there are two types of, ro of valves mainly in use these days. There are rotary valves, and there are piston valves. And the question from the customer is regarding piston valves, but we'll deal with rotors as well, because it's in the uh, different kinds of oil, different strokes, different folks, but the issue still stays the same. Um, the valve oil's purpose is, is twofold. Basically, valve oil reduces the friction. It reduces contact between, between the piston or the rotor and the casing. Basically, without the oil to provide a coating um, a Schutz self Deutsch to protect this, the metal will start to have contact with the other metal and you, you'll have increased friction. You'll have a resulting uh, transfer of metals from one side to the other and at some point it wears it down and you'll eventually wear the valve out. And I think, actually you have a good point about this. Sorry, please. Yeah, yeah um, I think why some people think they don't need the oil is because actually even a dry valve can work this is due to the fact uh, that usually the, the body of the valve and the casing are made of two different materials. Like on a piston, you would usually have a monel piston uh, or a nickel plated piston. And mostly stainless steel. Nowadays. Stainless steel. In German industry, it's mostly stainless steel. While the casing is rather made of brass or nickel silver. silver. Or bronze, actually. Sorry, or in bronze. Germany, that, that's quite common. And these both materials have different hotness which um he's, he's referring to the piston or the rotor the moving part and the the casing then these yeah. those components are, are usually of different materials and where you have a, a hot metal touching a soft metal you already have a reduced friction this is how a, a plain bearing right works that's why also the reason why a chrome plated uh Trombone slide will work right. good on a, on, a, on a brass outer slide. Right. But by applying oil, you will increase the longevity and the, how do you say, stamina of the material. Yeah, it'll basically everything will, will maintain its uh, structure, its integrity a lot longer. Yeah. And following along with that, uh, the other reason, the second key point of valve oil, it's not just to reduce friction, but it also. Uh, coats. When you pour a valve oil inside a, onto a valve or inside of an instrument, you are effectively sealing your coating 
Hey everyone, sorry about that. Uh, I had to take a break here for a second, but we're back. Okay, we were talking about the reason why you pour oil into your instrument. Okay, on the valves and through the whole instrument. My point I was trying to make was that to protect the inside of your horn from moisture, from things corroding, from rotting out, from causing all the metal-y bits to stick together, you will, uh, by pouring oil into your instrument, and that's not just the valves, um, we recommend uh, trumpet players also to put a few drops in their lead pipe, maybe in the tuning slide, um, also for French horn players into their slides. However, this comes with a caveat. If you pour it into the slides of your horn, be careful to hold it in such a way that the oil only goes into the valves or into parts that don't have grease on them. Because otherwise the valve oil will thin the grease and then drag it into a moving part like a valve. And we don't want that either. It might slow your valves down. So, but basically the point of valve oil is to, um, is to reduce friction so that the parts move well and to increase the longevity of the parts and also to protect against corrosion. So it's not just a lubricant, but it's also a protection. Moving on. So taking a question from a colleague in Finland. What makes a vina tuba a vina tuba? So wiener tuba. Wiener tuba. So <laughs> for those of you who don't know what this is, no, they do not make tubas out of sausages, although that would be pretty awesome. If someone ever does it, please send me a picture. I want to see what this looks like. Sausage tubas. OK, uh, a few things just real quick. Vina tubas, Vienna tubas. So oh. let us shout out to Mr. Gerhard Czechmeister. Czechmeister, oder? In Wien, Vienna. From the Wiener Blechbläser Quintet Oculus. He wrote a little booklet on the Entwicklung der Wiener Konzerttuba, Basstuba in F mit sechs Ventilen. Unfortunately, it's only available in German, but rumors run that he is working on out something wow. new. Jake, do you have any information about Ooh, that? I don't know how far along it is, but he's basically spent, I believe, a good part of his career doing research on Wiener tubas and also the history of tuba in Austria, especially in orchestra and also in opera, such as dealing with the first tubas regarding Wagner, uh, what was used. And I don't know how close he is to publishing this, but we do know he is working on this. And in the meantime, we no. put uh, the name of the little booklet on the right. description if you are able if you dominate the German, you are. If the language isn't a problem for you. Um, also, if there are any Germans listening to this podcast, um, if you are, or Austrian, sorry, or German Swiss, um, I think those are the German speaking, or if you're from Texas and you speak German too, because there are some Texan Germans. If you are writing a book um, for brass players, would you please put it in more than one language? That'd be very kind. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, getting back to the question what makes a Wiener Tuba a Wiener Tuba and not a hot dog? Actually, I met with I met with uh, Gerhard, um, I believe, a year ago. I had mm -hmm. a long talk with him. It was supposed to be a one-hour discussion. It turned into a, a six-hour love fest about um, Wiener tubas and Berliner tubas and so on. Um, just a long story short here, it was condensed six hours into a few minutes here. The word Wiener tuba or Vienna tuba is a bit of a misnomer. If you were living in Vienna and you played a tuba that you would think is a Wiener tuba, it was not actually called that. As, as Zachmeister writes in his own book here, it is a bass tuba in F with six valves. But there are a few characteristics that, that make it particular to the region. Um, there are a lot of six valve, other six valve F tubas that are bass F tubas, but they are not called Wiener tubas. So basically, um, there are tubas that are, oh, so actually Vina tuba is not a real word. You would actually just say a bass tuba in F with six valves, but you would, <laughs> at some point, I think, uh, I believe in the 60s or the 1960s or 70s, uh, to make it clear that this was a tuba that came from Vienna or that region and not from somewhere else, they started calling them Vina concert tubas. Basically, a Vina, Vienna or Vina concert tuba is a tuba that was used in an orchestra or an opera setting in F with six valves in, in Austria. Um, and it has a different fingering system and orientation than most other F tubas. Basically, you have three valves in your left hand and you have three valves in your right hand. And one particular detail, true vena tubas, the valves are not just three plus three, they actually are separated by a long, uh, long series of tubes. So you will see some tubas that are in vena form 
like some Alexandras or other companies, where all six valves are in a row, like a normal F tuba, but just the the fingerings you are set up so that you have the linkage for the first three valves in your left hand and the first three valves in the other hand. This is basically a tuba in vena form. Um, a true vena tuba, however, has the uh, one, two, three valves actually separate from the other three valves. And this allows for a lot of other construction details, such as a shorter lead pipe and blah, yada, 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 and all sorts of other things. But basically, a vena tuba is, is this six valve base tuba in F that was used in the orchestra in, in Vienna. And also to finish the question, what makes a vena tuba a vena tuba uh, and not say, for example, Moritz tuba, it does have six valves. Although there were Swedish tubas and Danish tubas that also use six valves, um, there's a lot of nomenclature, a lot of confusion here with this. So um, basically, if the tube is used in Austria, it has a three plus three system. The valves are separate from each other and it's a small F tuba. That's pretty much a vena tuba, okay? There are a lot of in between things, a bit of gray areas. And that's, but that's basically it. I'll put up a, a link to Zeckmeister's book and I'll also put a picture of what I consider to be a true Vienna tuba or Vienna tuba, okay? A little fun fact aside, uh, Martin Lechner, he made a copy of a Vienna tuba. Who's Martin Lechner? Martin Lechner? Yeah, it's you mean the trumpet maker. maker. Oh, the trumpet maker, sorry. Yeah, the okay. trumpet maker. Okay. He is also able to make uh, tubas. Like he made um, the bell mandrel out of pier. Wood and oh right, yeah. So the normal human can pick it up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, actually, it's a good wood for turning and uh, hard enough to make a uh, bell He made only two instruments, as far as he told me la last year. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just uh, interesting. Uh, just to add on to that real quick, there is also another Austrian maker, a very famous horn maker. Uh, I believe Andreas a Jungwert. Mm -hmm. It's Andreas, yeah. Uh, shout out, man. Um, there, um, he also has a vena tuba in the um, offered, and they, uh, I believe, it's quite true in spirit to the to the originals. Uh, so, if you happen to have any contact there, we'll we'll put a link up to his website as well. So, okay, okay. So, I think that answers the question. Also, you're probably more confused now than you were before, but basically, that's a vena tuba. Okay. And Jake almost lost his temper. <laughs> yeah, I got preying. I'm shouting at the mic here. All right. Um, moving on. Okay, our product of the week. And this time I am sh shamelessly whoring myself out here. For tuba players, this is to all the tuba players out there. I know I love you all. Thank you so much. There were, in the early mid-1990s in the U.S., there is a mouthpiece maker who still exists. This, her name is Dave Hauser, who makes very beautiful modern stainless steel mouthpieces for tubas and French horns and among other things. Um, beautiful mouthpieces, you should check them out. Dave, however, uh, Mr. Hauser, in the 1990s made a series of mouthpieces for the tubist of the New York Philharmonic at that time. His name was Warren Deck, or is Warren Deck, I believe he's still alive. And these were a set of heavyweight mouthpieces. And they came in a series of three uh, sizes. There was a number one, there was a number two, and number three. And these were, made in a quite a limited production there were there were quite a number sold but nothing like like a mass-produced mouthpiece from companies like bach or 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 clear or some of these it was a small production and then once they were gone they were gone they then because they were there was such an enthusiastic reception you know, sometime in the mid 2000s there was a second production run but only in stainless steel and also a very short uh, run of these so i uh, manage over the years to, to find a few of them in brass that I really, really liked. I especially have two that I really like. And I, I pestered uh, uh, Dave for a couple times over the years. And, you know, he's running a great business there. Um, you should check out his modern mouthpieces. Absolutely fantastic <coughs> work. But he's like, ah, you know, this old stuff, it belongs to the past, moving on. And he works in stainless steel primarily nowadays. So I wanted the original one in brass. And now I can tell you that we can actually, from Berlin here, can offer you copies of very very exact copies of these mouthpieces in brass, uh, in silver plate. We can also offer in gold plate if you like, but just to warn you, the price of gold right now has gone astronomical to the point to where... Skyrocketing. Yeah, right? Uh, <coughs> wow. Rocket ships there. Um, so basically, I have the models uh, 1. I have a 2F. F means the rim is slightly flatter, more like a Hellberg rim. And I have the number 3 uh, with a, the larger bore. 
and I believe I have a 3F, I have to double check. And I also have uh, one that's an Igly model that was a custom one made in the 90s, that's a Helleberg, but uh, with the, the outer shell form. So um, these are all in Euro shaft. Uh, they are silver plated, and I guarantee you these are identical to what you would experience in the 90s. And for those of us who heard Warren Deck live, or saw him use these in action, we know what these can do and what these sound like. So if you're interested in basically getting either hired or fired for your job, because these things are damn loud as hell, um, or especially if you, you have like a nice four quarter C2, but you wanna get more power out of it or a bit stuffy D flat, trust me, these will wake it up. So I think that's my promo podcast for that. So that's basically our Just product. Just a question, they look pretty heavy. Do you remember how much they weigh? Oh each? yeah, thanks. Um, these are 444 grams wow. each. And they have a very pe peculiar outer shape. Oh yeah, getting the history of that right. Can I ask, actually, I wonder if Dave would actually ever comment about that, but apparently the, the handle, um, I believe Warren was the one who told me this, but the handle or the, the <laughs> rim shape is basically uh, like a copy of the of the handle of a police officer's like baton from Bronx in New York. And these were called like Billy Bronx Busters. So it's basically a heavyweight mouthpiece, like incomparable to a Monet or, or a PT Plus or a Bach, Bach heavyweight. Um, but in this case, it's a bit more stylish. So definitely, it's definitely a looker though when you see it though. It doesn't look like anything. <laughs> and moving on. Okay, so last part of our podcast, my colleague here, especially <coughs> Matthias, we, or he, sorry, had a very interesting German trombone, Deutsche Posaune, that yeah. came in. <coughs> Customer came in, he just bought this uh, beautiful romantic uh, German trombone. And when you say romantic, do you mean like it's got hearts drawn all over it, or like that refers nah, to the time it's more or? like from the romantic era, 19th okay. century. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, maybe I, tell a bit more about the um, development of the German trombone another day. Just let's focus on this particular instrument. It is made by a certain Robert Chopper and the engraving says R. Chopper Proflifferant Leipzig. And it has a strange kind of um, rotary valve design on it. So this is a uh, this is basically just for those because you can't see us. Sorry, <coughs> guys. Uh, this is a tenor trombone mm -hmm. um, with uh, one rotary valve with a quad valve. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of nice uh, nickel silver trimmings, trimmings and engravings. The whole thing's engraved everywhere. I mean, not engraved, but there's like turning lines everywhere. Yeah, and they have snakes this, on it. Yeah, there's little snakes and the oak. Uh, not how do you say it? Yeah, like uh, acorns, acorns. Uh, engraved and like turned on it. Yeah, so it's basically quite a quite a looker though. So you wouldn't mistake this for, for mm -hmm. anything else. This is definitely a German and trombone. And it's so lightweighted. Yeah, the bell the bell's like paper basically. Pretty, I don't know how pretty. thick how thick would you say the metal is on the bell? Uh, probably after spinning and everything it gets down to zero point three wow. millimeters. Wow, like what would a, what would say a, like a modern like Bach forty two in comparison? What would it be? Point five, point six. Wow. Okay. So this almost half the thickness. Holy smokes! Yeah. On the on, on the outer edge, it's it's not consistent over the right the whole uh, bell. But yeah, let, let's talk about this maker, Robert Chopper. Or what can I say about him? And especially about this live design. Uh, uh, so for those <coughs> who can't see, I'm sorry, there uh, you go. But those who can't see the, the ro there's a rotary valve, a uh, quad valve, like I mentioned, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have any linkage on it. It basically yeah. has a no string. lever. There's no lever, sorry, and basically you turn the valve by uh, taking a piece of string and wrapping it around your thumb and or finger and moving it. Yeah, but yeah. okay. Uh, more to the lady. Yeah. So uh, Robert Chopper, uh, he was born in 1859 in the small town of Adorf. This is, this is in the Vogtland area. It's just the neighbor town of Magnokirchen. Maybe that rings a bell. There's a good pizzeria there. If not, just uh, please do your research. It's <laughs> really important for the brass instrument history. And <coughs> apparently he was trained by August Piring Sr. As uh, Mario uh, Enrico Vella just found out recently, or a couple of years ago. And as after finishing his, his apprentice, he, he really went on a grand tour, journeymate tour in, in the old German craftsman tradition that you would like uh, spend your apprenticeship with your master and then travel around 
and work for different companies trying to get better in your art. And no. he really he really took it pretty serious. Did he did he actually leave Germany or did he just stay in Germany? No, he Germany? he take took a big tour for Europe uh, oh, to wow. all the most important makers. He went to Pencil in Leipzig. Wow, okay. Which was a very renowned shop by that time, but more on that maybe in a different podcast. Um, spent some time there in 78 and he went to uh, Tetscher in Berlin and he spent some time in Switzerland with his partner and got to Milano too and at the end he went to Heckel in Dresden which was a very wow. renowned if, shop if you know anything about like these <coughs> makers like from 150 years ago these, these were basically some of the top shops from from the workshop from the history of the so company. he went there he worked yeah. there he patched the knowledge and finally in 1888, 89, he got married and set up his own shop in Leipzig. And Leipzig was a pretty important city for the development of the trombone. Actually, it was there where the Sattler workshop developed the... Basically the modern German trombone, right? The modern yeah. romantic, oh, the romantic trombone story. and uh, was the first one to add a valve to the tenor-based trombone. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in... 1898, um, he uh, registered a uh, so-called Gebrauchsmuster, yeah. which isn't exactly a patent. It's like the small brother of the patent. Ah, okay. The, the process was a little bit easier and cheaper, ah, but okay. wouldn't be for so many years and right. had to be renewed regularly. And it was published in the Zeitschrift für Instrumentenbau, which was uh, a magazine about instrument making in Germany. Yeah. And it says, uh, it talks about this new valve design, which has no lever and no apparently seeable spring. Oh yeah, it's it's completely <coughs> covered. It's like super slick. Like, but there's yeah. a like uh, uh, nickel silver cap mounted on the rod itself, and inside it contains a flat clock spring, right. which keeps the tension. And then you just attach a string to it and activate that one with your thumb. Yeah, uh, it's, it's nice how simple it is actually. Compared to all the modern modern linkages, it's it's um, surprisingly uh, elegant how, how, how clean it is. Yeah, well, you don't <laughs> see them that much anymore. But yeah, so so why is the Schopper guy? Why is he so famous though? Basi basically, when we talk about German trombones, there that you like Sattler is the big name. You um, I try to remember the the other big ones like like uh, Heckel, Heckel Peering, Peering, right? Actually, yeah, all those he got in contact with. Yeah, that's what. So when you come across an early Schopper trombone, it is possible that it hasn't even uh, Schopper written engraved on the Bergkranz. But the first ones, he would mark them with J dot C dot pencils nach Folger. So for non-German speakers, nach Folger is uh, the, the successor. successor I guess, yeah. Because uh, as Settler was such a big name and Pencil, who was his son-in-law, carried on this, this fame, Schopper would yeah, kind of ride on that wave. Right and using the popularity of his name to establish himself as a maker right. and it's not completely true uh, sure <laughs> if he was actually the successor because he opened his shop about 10 years <laughs> after <laughs> pencil and his son died uh, so it was a gangster move basically <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe he could have purchased some of the tools ah, from the widow. Right, that's right. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. We don't know. But after a couple of years, he he made his name. He became even a royal baron to the Duchy of Anhalt right. in 1912. And you can, when you look at the bell, like like Matthias was saying, you see the words Hoflieferant. which yep. basically means delivery. Uh, royal baron. It's royal, the royal baron. Yeah. So the trombone I was talking first it has this little crown on it and says hopefully for it so it is it has to be after 1912 right. and before 1919 when monarchy got banned in Shops. Germany so yeah uh, Schopper he he died in 1938 in Leipzig his son Fritz Arno Konstantin 
who had entered the shop in 1924 mm -hmm. carried on but they got bombed out in the war the second war right yeah 43 yeah. and 48 he finally had to sh shut down the shop so that's where the story ends apparently but there was an apprentice of shopper his name was Herbert Ledge and he made his way to West Germany after the war and set up a shop in Bremen which still exists so the trombone connoisseurs among you will you know this name recognize the name yeah there you go and he himself trained a series of skilled instrument makers who themselves became yeah. famous makers as Heinrich Tein from the Tein brothers right. And Hans Kromat, who happened to be my uh, master. And the shop is now run by his, I think, nephew, uh, Nina, um, Hans Hermann Ninawa. Ninawa, you know. Yeah. And is still there making very nice, Beautiful fine yeah. German style trombones. So, if you're looking for a new trombone. Oh, shout in. out to Ledge. You hear that, Ledge? <laughs> Put our check in the mail, guys. <laughs> Whether Ledge or Tyne or Chromat, yeah, they yeah. all do a great job. Yeah. Personally, I, I would recommend Chromat, of course. Very uh, cool. We all put this in the description and then just make you up. Oh. And if you are a German understander, speaker, reader, and want to know more about the history of the German trombone, then check out Die Deutsche Posaune, ein Leipziger Welterfolg. Can you still buy this catalog, actually? Yeah, they made a, a second reprint of that's it. That's right, that's right, okay. And, yeah, it has a lot of information. Most of what I am telling you, I got extracted from there. They really did a big deal and um, made some beautiful pictures yeah, in it. It's a really nice catalog. It was actually the catalog of an exposition yeah. uh, held in Leipzig in the year of 2010, I yeah. think so. Yeah, about 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you can get it for, I think, 25 euros from the uh, Instrument Museum in Leipzig. And yeah, that's it. Just for, my for part. anyone uh, listening, also, if there are any English speakers who would like to see this catalog translated into English, drop us a line. Maybe we can use it to pressure them into doing a third print, but this time in bilingual. So oh, nice. Just to tell you again, I know I already said it, yeah, but. I keep dreaming, Jake. Yeah, I know, I know. Don't they realize there's like other people out there who are interested in this as well, though, who like, don't speak German, you know? <laughs> I mean, you want to play the German trombone, you have to speak German. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's part of the studies, you know. <laughs> oh. Okay, so that's that's the basically the um, story of Schopper trombones from Leipzig. Unfortunately, got bombed, but as, uh, as Matthias said, they, in some sense, the colleagues who trained there went on to do absolutely fantastic work uh, in Bremen, uh, the three other, four other workshops there. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it for the podcast for today. Um, any last words? I mean, we had our dad joke before, so yeah. I don't have to add a another one. Yeah, I think one dad joke's enough. I don't know if anyone caught it or not, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking forward for more podcasts to come. Uh, the first time I was loafing, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hopefully I'm on the boat now regularly. Yeah. So and as we're telling our customers, they all get really excited and they all want to participate and contribute. So I'm very excited about. So stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Send us your questions. Send us your ideas. If you have any products you want to hear reviewed, let us know. Something you find interesting. If there are any instruments you're curious about, any questions about brass maintenance, repair, restoration, uh, new construction, let us know. We'll do our best to answer the questions. And I think that's it. So have a good weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.